Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors. Our partner projects the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Welcome back. So next up is Adrian, who will be talking about the KDE Free Qt Foundation. Uh, Adrian, the stage is yours. Thank you, Johan. It's good to be here, although I'm missing being there in Göteborg with you all. Uh, to everyone tuning in live, Hi, happy to have you here. My name is Adrian, and I'm going to be talking about the KDE Free Cute Foundation. I'm going to keep this fairly short. It's maybe a half hour or so, and I'm going to start my talk with a whole bunch of disclaimers. See, this is sort of kind of a licensing talk. I'm going to be talking about licenses and permissions granted uh, on software uh, by various entities, um, but I'm not a lawyer. And if I was a lawyer, I wouldn't be your lawyer. So this is not legal advice and any licensing decisions you take are your own responsibilities. Please be responsible when dealing with licenses. And speaking of licenses, you should have listened to the previous talk by Gabriel, which was all about getting your licensing information right. So that's my legal disclaimer. Then I'm gonna tell you, this is gonna be a little bit of a history talk. I'm gonna talk about good, the good old days and um, maybe tell people to get off my lawn. Um, remember the past is a different country and the way we look at free software nowadays is somewhat different from the way we did 20 years ago. And as we've noticed this month, uh, the world is never changing place. Uh, you never know what's going to come next. I'm also talking about other people's work. This isn't stuff that I personally uh, put a lot of effort into. Um, don't think that I'm taking credit for other people's work. Really, the people to thank uh, around the KDE Free Cute Foundation are Martin and Olaf. I'll mention them again later. So, those were my disclaimers. Let's move on to the title of this talk because uh, it's got a bunch of words in there that probably bear a little explanation. Uh, to start with KDE, it's the KDE Free Cute Foundation. Well, KDE is a community, a worldwide community that makes a whole bunch of software, uh, frameworks, plasma applications. We used to call it KDE uh, as a desktop environment. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we have uh, slightly more nuanced names for the software we do, but we're a large free software community that makes free software. Uh, remember that's free as in freedom and not free as in beer. Uh, we believe in the four freedoms as defined by the Free Software Foundation and supported by the Free Fo Software Foundation Europe. KDE builds on all kinds of free software foundations um, and mostly it uses a free software toolkit and that toolkit is Qt. Qt probably well known to many people in Göteborg because it gets used in so many industrial applications. Uh, Qt is a toolkit for creating user interfaces. It's both cross and multi-platform. Um, cross-platform in the sense that it runs on all the free software operating systems that you want, like FreeBSD, Linux, OpenSolaris. It also runs on a bunch of proprietary operating systems. And it runs up and down the stack, uh, desktops, laptops, and mobile devices as well, and embedded. The KDE Free Cute Foundation is, moving on to the last word in the title here, um, it's a foundation. That, that is to say, it's an independent organization, independent of KDE itself, independent of Cute. Uh, it lives on its own. And the reason for that is that we need, um, we don't want it to be, to owe anything to KDE or to Cute. It should be beholden to neither. Um, and live its own life because it has its own purpose, this Free Cute Foundation. 
why and what is this? Well, we need to look at the old days, a little bit of history of Qt. Um, and this is, this is condensed down. Uh, if you want more details, Wikipedia always is exhausting uh, in terms of historical details. But it comes down to uh, around the mid 1990s, um, there was a toolkit being built for X11 Unix. Remember that was proprietary Unixes, basically SunOS, uh, HP UX. It was also being built for Windows. And then when Linux showed up on the uh, on the playing field, uh, Qt for X11 and Linux was first released under the Qt Free Edition license. And that kind of ran into to issues. Um, because the Qt Free Edition license uh, was not an open source license. It wasn't free software. Um, it was intended as such, but the letter of the law was different. So then Qt was released two years later, 1998, under the Q Public License. The Q Public License is an open source license. It meets the definitions, or it meets the requirements of the open source definition, um, but it's still yet another free software or yet another open source license. Um, and since we don't like open source license proliferation, uh, it took a, another two years and then Qt for X11 Linux was released under the GPL v2. So at that point, it was straightforward, free software, no questions asked. Five years later, moved on to GPL v3 and the Windows code uh, was released as well. Four years later, it was made, some might say, freer by being released under the LGPL. A lot of people uh, still use Qt under the LGPL because it's a nice unrestrictive license, lets you do a lot of embedding and uh, uh, yeah, let's just say you can embed it in, into stuff and not need to worry about all the provisions of the GPL. Um, in 2011, the commercial licensing arm, remember Qt is during all this time being developed by a company. Um, and so it also has a commercial licensing arm. The commercial licensing arm was sold to Digio. So there's a lot of back and forth on the licensing situation. It's been licensed under a number of different free software licenses and it's also been licensed all this time under commercial terms. And so all that time, the KDE community building KDE software, uh, which has always been released under the terms of the GPL version two, or sometimes version three, uh, KDE has been around all that time, so it's gone with the times. Um, so all the time we've had this free software uh, based on Qt and there's this continual back and forth between KDE and Qt, uh, code moving one way or the other, uh, KDE writing fixes for things in Qt and Qt producing new features that then get used in KDE software. So there's this strong back and forth on the free software front. If we move into modern times after the, the sale to Digia, um, in 2012, we've got Qt 5, which is now triple licensed. Parts of it are GPL v3, parts of it are LGPL v2, and there's also some bits that are only commercially licensed. There was open governance created uh, in order to uh, carry on the free software development of Qt, and uh, nowadays there's a number of products uh, coming out of the Qt company uh, that are not exactly Qt. Some of them are labeled Qt. Uh, for instance, Qt Embedded, I believe, is a product that looks like Qt, but isn't. So if we look at the current licensing situation, uh, Qt 5.14 is one of the most recent releases. I think 5.15 is scheduled for May. Um, you can get that under the GPL v3, the LGPL v2, and also commercial terms. Uh, not all of the components of Qt are available under all of these different licenses. Um, there's Qt Essentials, uh, sort of the, the core and the widgets and uh, things like that. 
uh, those are available under uh, specific free software licenses. Uh, and then there's um, add-ons and uh, interoperation bits, some of which fall under commercial terms. The KDE community, of course, cares most about the free software parts. So the free soft, the, the stuff, the parts of, of Qt that are released as free software uh, that get used by KDE, by KDE software. Um, that means that there's parts that we don't particularly care about, but looking at, at the entirety of Qt's offerings, all of it is important. Um, I should add somewhere during this talk, if you use Qt, contribute. Um, it's a re recurring theme in free software development is how do we fund this stuff? How do we make sure that uh, development continues? And it's really important to distinguish uh, free software users from freeloaders. Free software users can contribute by contributing patches, writing documentation, doing promotion, um, and freeloaders don't do that. And if you can't use it as free software and contribute through free software, you should probably be paying for the software in some way. So if you use Qt, contribute, don't be a freeloader. Um, and carrying on with the current uh, licensing situation, uh, there's a really good talk by Burkhardt Stubert on uh, making sure that your systems uh, comply with the LGPL version three uh, when you're using Qt. It's not that hard, then you are a free software user of Qt. Um, and if you do that, you should contribute through patches code, etc. Watch Burkhardt's talk, it's on YouTube. There's a link, there will be a link in my slides eventually. So returning to the history, right? We just talked a little bit about the current situation. Returning to history, Qt was originally intended to be released as open source. It got screwed up. Then it was released as free software. It's still free software. It's important to note that Qt has been around for these 20 years more than 20 years, and it's still free software. But early on, um, because of these, these issues with licensing and hey, we got it almost right, uh, there was an, an early recognition that doing it as free software, doing it in an open source way was the right thing to do with Qt, but also that we needed some mechanism to keep it free software. Remember, if your free software is owned by a company, then that company can, well, basically run off with it. Look at what Oracle did with Open Solaris, for instance. Um, you, when you depend on free software from some specific company, you should keep in mind that uh, it is the power of that open source, of the open source license that keeps the company uh, honest, but you need more. And that's where the KDE Free Qt Foundation comes in because this is a foundation, it holds a contract. Um, and the contract basically says that if Qt stops being open source, then the last available version of Qt is automatically released under the BSD2 clause license. There's details there. Um, that contract was originally signed with Trolltech. Um, Trolltech was the company that, that was building Qt back in the 90s. And um, this underscores their belief uh, in the power of free software. The contract carries on to Trolltech and all of its successors. So when Nokia bought Trolltech um, in 2009, I think that was, uh, the, the contract carried on to them and it continues to be handed on to each of the corporate holders of Qt and their successors. So this contract, I'll go back one slide, <coughs> tells whoever is building, whoever owns Qt right now, and whoever is building Qt, that 
that if Qt stops being open source, it is released under the BSD2 clause license. That's an escape hatch. It means that the entire free software community that depends on Qt, um, and remember that's more than just KDE. There's um, a lot of uh, free as in beer commercial software um, that uses Qt. There's VirtualBox, there's MuseScore, those aren't free software. Uh, MuseScore, I think Rose Garden does as well. Plenty of free software out there that uses Qt. Um, and all of it has this same escape hatch. The same escape hatch that, that means that depending on Qt is not a risk because if something goes wrong with the free, with the uh, free softwareness of Qt, that is, if Qt stops being open source, it gets released under a very liberal free software license. And we, the free software community as a whole, can carry on with it. So there's a fork path if needed. But clearly this is a nuclear option, right? You don't want development to stop. You don't want the owners of Qt to stop Qt being free software. You want to encourage the owners of, of Qt to keep it free software. So that's why I said earlier, if you use Qt, contribute, because that's how you help Qt remain free software. But if we need it, we as in the free software community, we can deal, we can, we can deal with it. Because the, what is covered by this contract um, are the core platforms, X11, Android, um, there's additional platforms, um, and th this reflects the, well, let's call it the traditional uh, interest of the KDE community, is our interest is the free software operating systems uh, running X11, old school stuff. Um, there's an update clause in there. Uh, the KDE Free Qt Foundation has the right to update to a supported successor platform. Basically, this is saying, when X11 is no longer interesting, but Wayland is, we can switch to Wayland, uh, no questions asked. And then the Qt for Wayland uh, part becomes the covered part under the contract. That means that moving forward, when the whole desktop world, the whole Linux world moves to Wayland, eventually, you know, this is, this is like the year of the Linux desktop, there's the year of the Wayland desktop uh, is always sometime in the future. But when we get to Wayland, this contract can be updated to use Wayland. And that means that if Qt ever stops being open source, all the Wayland users of Qt uh, are still covered. The license terms are, uh, so of the contract, say that all the parts of Qt must be available under specific licenses. Um, the core libraries need to be LGPL. LGPL alongside their commercial licensing op options. And this just means that the contract forces the owner of Qt to keep developing and releasing it as LGPL software. So that depending on it is not a risk. The other bits and pieces of Qt can be LG, uh, GPLv3. They can also be LGPLv3 or sometimes GPLv2. Um, because the software has been developed over a long time, there's there's plenty of variation in the license. Again, look at, look at Burkhard Stubert's talk uh, uh, for help on figuring out exactly what is needed where. And look at Gabriel's talk from Foss North this morning on how to keep track of all the metadata for your licensing. Um, hang on. Yep. So to backtrack and summarize, what we've got is a 20-year-old belief in 
Qt should be open source. Qt should continue to be developed as open source. And we've got a, a hammer, well, a nuclear option really, that says if it ever stops being open source, then uh, there's an escape hatch. And that means that the entire free software community can depend on using Qt as free software. Of course, there's, there's issues there, right? There's, there's always some tension between freeloaders and contributors, between freeloaders and free software users. Um, we in the KDE community feel pretty strongly that you should be writing free software anyway and contributing through free software. Um, and if you want to write proprietary software, well, go ahead, but pay for it. Um, yeah, this basically wraps up uh, my description of the KDE Free, Free Qt Foundation. It's out there, it's still running, it has a website, and there's a specific legal uh, agreement. Um, I've summarized it in my talk about under what conditions uh, the whole thing triggers. Um, I said it a couple of times, if Qt ever stops being open source, then uh, it is released under the BSD2 clause. Uh, there's, the specific terms are, are rough. This is a confusing sentence. The terms are approximately this. If no new free software release of Qt shows up in 12 months, then three months after that, uh, the nuclear option gets triggered, but it doesn't have to be triggered. There's a great deal of talking back and forth between the KDE Free Cute Foundation and the Cute Company to make sure that uh, we're we keep each other honest, we keep each other on track to develop uh, things as best we can. When my slides go online, you will be able to click on website and the agreement bits there. Uh, to get to the specific text if that's what you're interested in. Now I'm going to move on to questions and I see that I finished quite on time. Questions? Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear Hendrik. Hi. Lovely, lovely. Hi. So uh, here's the first one. What is, sorry, I need to move a window here. Uh, what is your view on the latest developments? Uh, for example, that the Qt company want backport fixed to older open source versions? It, of course, I'm going to get this question. So I'm going to <clears throat> stress that I am not a member of the KDE Free Qt Foundation, and I'm going to answer this question uh, with my own hat on. Um, last I heard is that the security fixes would be going into the LTS uh, branches, uh, but it continues to be an item for discussion. Um, I think that people using LTS uh, versions under the free software uh, license should, should, right? And here, here's mostly a moral obligation uh, should also be contributing to uh, maintenance thereof. So I can find it in my heart to forgive uh, the Qt company if they decide not to backport fixes to LTS themselves. Um, I can also totally imagine a foundation being called into existence um, under the Commons Conservancy or under, I don't know, some consortium um, that does that LTS maintenance itself. It would be weird. I'm not sure whether there's any software products where LTS support is done by an association outside of the original pr producer. Um, but that would make, that would sort of make sense for me. Okay, KDE and GNOME has a lot of contributors. What are the most important things to think about when starting a project? Well, that's a that's an amazingly broad question. 
Um, the most important thing when starting a project is to know in your own mind what is the problem you want to solve and then just pick the best tools and um, pick a good license as well. Um, this is this is me stepping sort of onto onto Gabriel's uh, turf, I guess. Um, pick a good license. Either go for choose a license suitable for broad adoption, for uh, broad contribution, uh, or for revenue maximization. Um, I won't say those are mutually exclusive, um, but if you pick BSD two clause for your license, then you're going to have a different time uh, getting contributions than if you do pick the GPL v3. Um, short answer, no, okay. what the problem is. Uh, do you think the acute license and your relationship with the company is having an, an effect, negative or, or positive, on your community? Um, I think it has a positive effect um, in that it's it, it's a it's a bit of an adverse adversity breeds unity, right? Um, as as we sort of wrestle with the current changes in in the cute licensing landscape, um, the KDE community comes together with okay we. We need this stuff doing, um, and as the largest free software consumer of Qt, uh, we feel that uh, we represent a large, and, uh, su sufficiently large population to uh, get stuff done. So I'm going to call it positive, even though it feels uh, feels like we're wrestling with negative. Uh, with a negative situation right now. All right. Okay. Uh, the contract mentioned in the talk uh, is currently between the Qt company and KDE EV? Question mark. No. The contract is between the Qt company and the KDE Free Qt Foundation. Like I said at the beginning, this is an independent organization. Um, it has board members who are uh, who come from KDE EV. It has board members who come from the Qt company, um, but it is independent of KDE EV. And if the contract triggers, then it is the foundation that receives the right to uh, release Qt under the the BSD two clause. And it is not KDE EV that really receives that right. So it's independent. Uh, and the final question then, how much is KDE contributing to the QT source code? Um, that, that's, a, that's an excellent metrics question. Um, one that I don't have concrete numbers for, but just watching uh, IRC at like basically KDE Plasma IRC and the number of, of upstream bug reports and upstream bug fixes that, that come from that. Um, I would guess, and in this case guess basically means I'm going to make up a number and say, oh, about a quarter of uh, acute contribution comes directly or indirectly through KDE. But like I said, that's a guess. Okay. With that last question, I think I'll leave over to you one. Yeah, and I would like to extend a really big thanks to, to Adrian to, to coming over and also to our viewers to, to attending and asking good questions. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.